On the news ahead of 2023 presidency, reverse governor Yeso Wike says PDP will lose without him. Afe Babalalasa calls for interim government in place of 2023 elections. And IMF raises Nigeria's 2022 growth forecast from 2.7% to 3.4%. So glad to have you join us on News Now. I am Folashani Ogurinde, River State Governor and Presidential Aspirant on the platform of the People's Democratic Party. Governor Yeso Wike said the party risks losing the presidential seat if he's not been considered in the race. We've seen of his popularity and capacity to lead Governor Wike during his meeting with the PDP National Working Committee on Tuesday. However, called the Nigerians to shun deceit from the ruling All Progressives Congress while wooing the NWC to support. Respondent, the Chairman National Working Committee, Yocha Ayu, assured the presidential hopeful that there will be no foul play or manipulation in the party adding that the party will also ensure that every member of the National Working Committee works for the interest of the party. So I'm not going to say if I lose, I have Senate. You know, the only thing I have is this presidency. I'm not going to run for any other election. Because I know it will be the past people like us to face APC. Everybody in this country knows me. My views on national issues, it is not to be uh, conjecture. Nobody can say, oh, I don't know whether we can do this or whether we do not do that. Everybody should know me very well that when I see issues, I say this is my view, and of course I'm not going to run away from it. Let me assure you that this National Working Committee will try to uphold the traditions of the People's Democratic Party. And that tradition since 1999 is of the running very credible, transparent conventions, starting from JOS to the last one that produced this National Working Committee. I want to assure you that there will be no foul play, no manipulation. We will certainly do better than what we did in October last year. Legal luminary Afeba Balola says Nigeria should suspend plans for the 2023 general elections and opt for a stopgap interim government. Babalola, who is also a senior advocate of Nigeria, made the proposal on Monday at a media briefing held at the Afe Babalola University in Adokiti, the Ekiti state capital. He raised fears that using the current constitution to conduct another election in Nigeria would only reproduce a faulty leadership and system being experienced in the country. The legal icon for the stress that a new constitution has become an urgent need. A body judge chieftain of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, says the party will be roundly defeated in the 2023 presidential election if zoning is jettisoned. Speaking in an interview with journalists on Tuesday, judge warned that failure to zone the PDP presidential ticket means the party is looking for serious trouble in 2023. The PDP is yet to make a decision on which region of the country will produce the party's 2023 presidential candidate. The development has spawned polarized opinions among stakeholders of the party, with some backing the zoning of the presidential slot to the south, while others are calling for the ticket to be thrown open to all regions of the country. Well, joining me to discuss this for that is legal expert and political affairs analyst Libora Soshoma. I uh, thank you very much for joining us. Now, uh, let's start with um, Afe Babalola's statement. Uh, what do you make of the legal icon statement uh, that Nigeria should opt for a stopgap interim government? Do, do you think uh, this is the right, um, uh, the right step in the right direction? Uh, I completely disagree with that um, proposal. Uh, even though I agree that um, 
1999 constitution as amended is faulty. But I disagree with an interim government. Um, against the backdrop, like I always say, of the experience we had with interim governments. We had an interim national government and uh, the, that government didn't last for, for, for two months and it was booted out by, you know, a military government. And so having an interim government is an indirect way of calling for another military interregnum, which we cannot afford at this stage. Um, if, if as 40, as, as, um, uh, as crisis reading, as we were in 1963. If we are allowed to wumble or fumble and then with the election, we probably by now would have gotten it right. But we always found a way, an easy way out. And that's, I think, is one of, um, and that's the same proposal that uh, um, the learned jurist is making also, the learned um, senior advocate is making also now, um, interim national uh, government. Where are we going to draw the people from? Is it not the same? Former, he proposed a former president and former head of state. Is it not the former president, the same former president and former head of state that led us to where we are today now? That for 60 years have not been able to give us more than 5,000 megawatts of electricity that um, is proposing to come and head the same interim national government. So I, I think what, we'll, uh, what we have, as much as it is not a perfect document, what we should be advocating for, it will have. Um, what we initially we said once we have uh, um, electronic transmission of results, we would at least take a step further. What we should be advocating for now is that you know we should put structures in place to ensure that the election, even though not perfect, at least is near transparent and where people's votes would truly count. Otherwise, we are not going to draw the leaders from heaven. There are still going to be people amongst us. There are still going to be the same set of people. Some of them who are in national assembly now. And some of them who already are ministers, some of them who have also lost out in the former government, and then that would people the new government, whether you call him interim or ad hoc. You know, they are still going to be sharing contracts. They are still going to be fashioning a constitution that will be tailored along their whips and caprices. So what we have really is um, people, a set of people that really do not have, you know, the benefit, the mindset of, um, you know, actually doing good for the generality of the people. So whether you call them interim, whether you call them APC, whether you call them PDP, it is the same set of people that you're going to have. It is not lack of laws. Like I said, that we, it's our problem, but the we power to implement the laws. A lot of people supported Buhari, believing that he had the we power. But unfortunately, look at where we are today. So if you bring an interim government and you have somebody like Buhari, who is the leader, are you not going to have the same crisis? So let's talk about the argument whether or not to go for zoning. That's for the PDP. Now, where do you see this party leaning towards to? Do you think they will opt for for zoning, or do you think they will throw the ticket open? I, I think I think PDP is in a my ass presently uh, because um, they are really not too sure where they want to belong to, whether zoning or not zoning. Um, why they look? They are looking at their candidate. They are looking at. Um, the candidate that has um, the money to prosecute the election, uh, people like Atiku that has money to prosecute the election. But if you if you if you opt for zoning, uh, that will skim them out. And then looking at um, the southeast, are looking at their strong candidate, Peter Obi seems to enjoy you know the goodwill of a lot of people. But the question is, you know, does he have the money to, to prosecute the election? That's another thing they are looking at because if you know PDP, one of the biggest crises they consistently had had been you know the issue of money. Immediately they left government, they almost went broke. Uh, they were looking for people like Amadou um, uh, Sharif to bankroll the party. So nobody is ready to bring out or contribute to financing the party. And so that's the crisis they have. But I think if they harness their strengths together and actually, you know, maintain that zoning that they had started before now, I think it might give them a mileage, a long mileage. You know, remember this issue of zoning or no zoning almost tore them apart during the time of uh, President uh, 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 Obasanjo. Also, during the time of uh, uh, the interregnum between Yaradua and the uh, Gulag Jonathan, you had the issue of zoning or no zoning. Almost also tore them apart. And it was the fact that they did not follow that arrangement with uh, uh, Yaradua and Gulag Jonathan, you know, who benefited from the death of uh, Yaradua, did not follow through the issue of zoning. That was what eventually caused them that election. So I think uh, it would be in their interest to maintain that their tradition of zoning. 
But if they decide to opt out of it, then they must have a stronger reason, you know, and also find a way to have a candidate that will enjoy the massive support of uh, the entire Nigeria and not Southeast and West. Against also, like I always say, uh, the current challenges that APC is facing now, because it's almost a, 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 an impossibility that APC might be able to go through primaries the way they are going. Well, indeed, um, legal expert and political affairs analyst Libera Soshoma, thank you very much for your contribution. And still on electoral matters, an official of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Mike Igini, has taken a swipe at politicians sponsoring thuggery in the country. Igini, who is a resident electoral commissioner, wreck in charge of Aquaibom State, said this on Tuesday during an interview with journalists. He believes such persons pose a serious threat to the nation's democracy and asked them to stop the practice of engaging thugs and renting crowds for campaigns. According to the REC, sponsoring thuggery is just one aspect of security threats to electoral officials and the electorate during elections. Deva Top Center for Africa Development in partnership with the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, NAPTIP, has produced a drama skit on human trafficking and gender-based violence. The Tolkam short films, which was unveiled at the headquarters of NAPTIP in Abuja, aims to break the culture of silence towards trafficking in persons and sexual and gender-based violence. Our correspondent, Simi Saladigun, tells us more in this report. Nigeria is a source, transit, and destination country for women and children subjected to trafficking in persons, including forced labor and prostitution. While it may be argued that the country is grappling with the ills of human trafficking and the likes, it's also worth noting that a great stride has been made in this regard by way of convictions, sanctions, and the naming and shaming efforts. It is in a bid to improve the situation that Devatop, as part of Tokham Human Rights Project, has collaborated with NAPTIP to unveil two short films. The project, supported by the U.S. Embassy Nigeria, Paplona City Council and Axion Contra Spain, is an instrument to create awareness against human trafficking and sexual and gender-based violence. The executive director, Devatop, and the representative of the director general of NAPTIP are unanimous in their belief that the use of drama and skit will help reduce the scourge of human trafficking to its barest minimum. It's also on this, under this project that we partnered with NAPTIP to produce uh, two short films on human trafficking and gender-based violence, which is focused mainly on addressing, first educating people on the dangers of human trafficking and GBV and uh, breaking the culture of silence while stimulating them to report human trafficking. The importance of drama as kids in creating awareness on any issue including human trafficking and SGBV cannot be overemphasized. They are very powerful tools in changing behaviors as well as in selling any idea to the people. Because drama is entertaining and educating just as it is used to mirror the society. Development partners and other stakeholders also gave their take on the efficacy of films in sensitizing citizens and shaping their thoughts. I want to congratulate you on this initiative and the launching of these two skits and all of the other work that your team has been doing throughout Nigeria to bring public awareness to the fight against trafficking in persons. As you rightly stated, um, public awareness is one of the critical components to highlighting the plight of uh, millions of people who are trafficked uh, annually. And education is a key in helping to eradicate the scourge of human trafficking. But I want to say that the drama club in NAPTI started in 2018. And we are hoping to forge ahead and make more impact more than we are already doing to ensure that the fight of human trafficking in their own way is brought to the society. With the resolve to resort to performing arts and drama as a veritable prevention strategy, it's hoped that trafficking in persons, migrant smuggling and other similar human rights violations are on the verge of extinction. Simisola Chiku, TV360 News. 
We'll take a break here, but still to come, Uganda discharges last COVID-19 patients. Details of the story and more rights after this break. Opinions are free, facts are sacred, the truth is universal. How in practical terms can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? President must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places, um, the Lake Chad region, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Sambisa forest. On DG360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion facts and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians say in this uh, part of the world. The new Nigeria is possible, the future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for go any governor to look for grant for ranching. DG360, dissecting the issues. Welcome back. Now here is a recap of some of our top stories tonight. The River State Governor and Presidential Aspirant on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, PDP Governor Yeson Wike, has said the party risks losing the presidential seat if he is not being considered in the race. Boasting of his popularity and capacity to lead Governor Wike during his meeting for the PDP National Working Committee on Tuesday, have called the Nigerians to shun deceit from the ruling All Progressives Congress while winning the WNC and WC rather to support. We also told you that legal luminary Afeb Babalola says Nigeria should suspend plans for the 2023 general elections and opt for a stopgap interim government. Babalola, who is also a senior advocate of Nigeria, raised fears that using the current constitution to conduct another election in Nigeria would only reproduce the fault leadership and system being experienced in the country. Well, in case you need any of our news bulletin or for more updates, do log on to our website on www.tv360nigeria.com. You can also follow us on our social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and Google Plus at TV360 Nigeria. On Facebook, we are TV360 Online. Nigeria's recorded an additional 22 cases of COVID-19 infection. According to the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, the new infections were logged in three states and the Federal Capital Territory, FCT. Lagos recorded 10 infections, followed by Nasarawa, with six cases, while the FCT and Rivers reported three cases each. While 32 persons were discharged after they recovered from the infection, no death was reported, leaving the total fatality figure at 3,143. The Ugandan Ministry of Health has confirmed that there is no COVID-19 patient admitted to any hospital in the country. A spokesperson for the Health Ministry in a statement on Tuesday said despite some positive cases, a very negligible positive rate, the last coronavirus patients have been discharged. The latest statistics from the ministry indicate that between April 12 and April 14, a total of 27 cases were reported and the average test positivity rate was at 0.3%, which means the pandemic is under control. Ugandan authorities and health experts have attributed the decline in infections to the increase in COVID-19 vaccination coverage. I will take a break here and return with more stories in business. Just stay with us.
In the last three years, we have built a multi-purpose center, which is the envy of all in our constituency. And I can tell you that the people who are living there are already enjoying it. Guy, do you think what this man just said is true? See, I seriously doubt. I'm sure it's one of those, they are silly lies. And hey, wait, do you know there's a way to find out if these things he's saying is true or not? Ah. This is the construct app. It gives people like us a sure way to track implementation of constituency projects. It gives valid and verified information on location of projects, amounts allocated, amounts funded, the level of job done, and even the profiles of concerned legislators. You and I can post directly on this app. Are you serious? This is the go-to app if you want to know how our commonwealth is being expended by the government. Wow. Let's even see if what this man said is true. Show me. The Construct app is developed by Other People Nigeria with support from USAID and is available on both Google Play Store and Apple Store. Eh, that is true. <laughs> of course, I told you. Welcome back. Well, Simisla Adiguna joins us for more stories in business. Over to you, Simi. Thank you, Falashade. Welcome to business. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, has raised its forecast for Nigeria's economic growth in 2022 to 3.4%, up from 2.7% earlier projected, citing increase to in crude oil prices. The IMF disclosed this on Tuesday in its April World Economic Outlook report, released as part of activities at the opening ongoing IMF World Bank spring meetings. Similarly, the IMF upgraded its economic growth forecast for the sub-Saharan African region to 3.8% in 2022, representing a 0.4 percentage point increase from the 3.7% forecast made in January. It, however, reduced the global growth projection to 3.6% in both 2022 and 2023, citing the impact of the costly humanitarian crisis and economic damage from the Russian war on Ukraine. It's been more than a year since the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, issued a directive to all financial institutions in Nigeria banning the facilitation of all crypto-related transactions and payments. Following public outcry and an inquiry by the National Assembly, the CBN governor explained that the policy is in the best interest of depositors and the country's financial system. But a year after crypto trading has become more popular among Nigerians, a far cry from earlier predictions from experts and expectations of the federal government. Our correspondent for Lashadeo Gurindi tells us more in this report. It appears that all efforts by the federal government to dissuade Nigerians from engaging in crypto transactions may have become futile. Chainalysis, a blockchain data platform in its latest data, shows that Nigeria has the largest proportion of retail users conducting crypto transactions under $10,000. The country is also ranked top in its list of cryptocurrency users in Africa. In February 2021, the Central Bank of Nigeria issued a circular to all banks in Nigeria prohibiting facilitation of all crypto transactions. We know that cryptos or bitcoins have been used to facilitate scam, which we all popularly call 419 transactions. They have been known to facilitate money laundering. They have been known to be um, an avenue through which kidnappers receive ransom. And they have been known to be instruments that are used to finance terrorism. But this strong note of warning was not enough to deter banks. Almost exactly a year after, the CBN penalized six banks for 1.314 billion naira over alleged non-compliance with the regulation on cryptocurrency accounts. What then is driving the demand for cryptocurrency and why is peer-to-peer -peer transactions rising despite heavy government restrictions? So the Central Bank of Nigeria has asked the banks not to deal in cryptocurrencies. That's one. What that means is that if you want to send money to Nigeria, you have to send through a bank, right? So the CBN will either give you, or the banks will either give you dollar cash, or you exchange your, your dollar to Naira. With the crypto, you get a better rate. That's the simple um, answer. If you send crypto to Nigeria, you can sell that crypto to dollars or get the market rate for your crypto, which is much, much higher than what you get in the banks. 
there are also very, very low fees. I mean, I sent crypto to a guy in Nigeria, right? It was instantaneous. The charge was minuscule compared to what I would um, get from a bank. On government's concern over unregulated and unlicensed entities on the blockchain, experts say cryptocurrencies are not totally anonymous in operation. So you, you simply can't say it because it's going to be used for a bad thing, then we don't use it. Cash is also used for bad things, but we allow cash. So we have to go back, regulate crypto, and then bring it into the formal financial space. That, to me, I think is going to be a better way to achieve that purpose of remittances, but knowing who is remitting, where know your customer provisions. In 2021, the CBN launched Africa's first digital currency, e-Naira, to hopefully get Nigerians to switch away from cryptocurrency. The e-Naira is gradually gaining momentum as it was recently ranked number one global retail central bank digital currency with an increase to over 756,000 downloads as of December 2021. Fulashade Ogurindi, TV360 News. We'll take a short break now and be back with Stock Market Reports. Resuming from the Easter break, investors sure had a good first day of trading on the floor of the Nigerian Stock Exchange as markets appreciated by 0.07%. This appreciation led Benchmark All Share Index to close at 47,554 uh, basis points. Our current market capitalization stands at 25.6 trillion naira. 115 listed equities participated in trading on Tuesday, ending with 21 gainers against 31 losers. Top gainers on the list are led by Maya and Guinness. Uh, both equities had a combined uh, seven ni seven, six naira rather, 56 Kobo gain. On the losing side, FCMB Group uh, Academic Press came out last with a combined four naira, 53 Kobo. A total of 365 million volume of shares with a market value of 7,106 billion naira exchange hands in 5,790 deals. On the global scene, Sorry for that uh, long pause on the global scene. UK stocks FTSE were lower on Tuesday as the International Monetary Fund IMF slashed growth forecasts for Britain today, warning that inflation will hit spending and investment. It ended in the negative territory at 0.20%. Fortunately, the IMF forecast did not affect trade for US Dow Jones and Japan's Nikkei as both stocks inched up by 1.28% and 0.69% respectively. That's all on stock market. Market review back to you for Lashadi. For many thanks to me for that update. And on the foreign scene, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says Russia has begun the Battle of Donbass in the east, with a very large part of the entire Russian army now focused on this offensive. Zelensky's chief of staff, Andriy Yermak, in an address assured Ukrainians their forces could hold off the offensive in the second phase of the war. Despite no immediate comments from Russia's defense ministry on the latest fighting, Ukrainian media has reported a series of explosions, some powerful, along the front line in the Donetsk region. But up next is Entertainment Report on News Now. Nigerian singer Simi Solako Soko, simply known as Simi, marked her birthday on Tuesday and her musician husband, Adekule Gold, serenaded her with a heartfelt message on Instagram. Sharing a picture of himself and his wife, Adekule Gold described the mother of one as his angel from above. Taken to the comment section, Simi appreciated her husband for his message, describing him as the best lyricist from Ikotun to the world. 
Mbise Imo State is currently in a festive mood as actress Rita Dominic wet her pew Fidelis Anosike. Traditionally, Rita and her hubby arrived at her family compound around 1 p.m. to kickstart the traditional marriage. In trending clips, Nollywood stars Uche Jumbo, Iniedo, Chidi Mokeme, and Chioma Akwatha are seen screaming for joy when the actress checks up on them in their room. Friends of the actress are seen dancing in excitement as they all gather around the bride to be and that's all there is on the entertainment segment of news now Away from entertainment and now to sports, Cristiano Ronaldo will miss Manchester United's Premier League clash at Liverpool on Tuesday as a Portugal star mourns the death of his newborn son. Ronaldo and his partner had revealed in a social media post last October that the couple were expecting twins, but in a post on Monday, the striker shared news of his newborn's death, sparking an outpouring of support for his family across the football world. United, in a statement on Tuesday, revealed that Ronaldo would not play in his team's crucial meeting with bitter rivals Liverpool. Ronaldo's absence would be a major blow to fifth place United as they seek to improve their top four prospect against Liverpool, who can go above Manchester City to the top of the table if they avoid defeat. And that's the size of our news bulletin. Many thanks for watching. I am Fola Shadi. Ogurinde. Bye for now.